Hello and welcome to the second part of the Great Roast Revival series, produced by The Morning Advertiser and powered by Nor Professional. I'm The Morning Advertiser's managing editor Nicholas Robinson and coming up we'll be taking a look at different ways to plate up the Sunday roast. Let's face it, we've all been somewhere where everything has been piled high onto the plate, gravy oozing over the sides and vegetables hiding under mounds of other veg. But that needn't be the case. And it shouldn't be, considering most of us eat with our eyes first. But before we take a look at plating up, I spoke with an academic to help us understand what exactly a roast dinner provides us with when it comes to the senses. And now on to our first guest. Charles Spence is Professor of Experimental Psychology and Director, Crossmodal Research Laboratory at the University of Oxford. We're joined by him today to talk about consumer perceptions of the humble Sunday roast and how, as chefs, we can put up certain elements of the dish to raise its value to the customer. Charles, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, how powerful is the simple Sunday roast in terms of the emotions it evokes in people? Well, I think the um, the uh, Sunday roast, simple or otherwise, I'm not sure my, my wife would agree it was simple, um, is, is certainly more than just about nutrition, about feeding ourselves. I think it plays a role uh, psychologically uh, and uh, sort of emotionally and uh, something that stands as, as a kind of an occasion where people are brought together. So it has kind of a sort of symbolic role. Um, it may also be kind of interesting that it it's a, a meal that uh, where you maybe share the same food, which people might not do at other gatherings. Uh, very often the very same roast is kind of, you know, uh, uh, cut and doled out to the party. So it kind of brings people together through sharing the food in a very um, uh, sort of visible uh, way. It's one of those things I think that probably also triggers kind of nostalgia and emotion. It'll sort of take us back whenever we have that Sunday family meal. It will probably bring us back in some small way to previous times that we've had a similar meal before with friends, with family, uh, and the associated positive, hopefully, emotions. So this 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 Sunday roast is doing so much more than just feeding us. It's kind of um, fulfilling an emotional need uh, both making us feel like we belong through this sort of sharing of the food, uh, but also referencing those previous occasions in our past where we've had similar meals uh, before. So about the kind of comfort food, um, and maybe you might also say a nostalgia dish uh, as well. What sort of elements and, and how should chefs tap into these elements to, to really elevate the emotions? I suppose one of the things that uh, one thinks about with a Sunday roast is the uh, roast. Um, and uh, the kind of the associated smells that go with that. So I think very often today, especially with our you know, pre-prepared meals and the microwave meals, we kind of lost a lot of the sort of the, the sensory buildup to meal times that would have been there previously, and maybe nowhere uh, more so than uh, uh, the Sunday roast with those kind of a uh, sort of carbonized Maillard reaction kind of smells of the roasting meat. Uh, sort of diffusing through the house, uh, this a dish that will take you know, some time to prepare, uh, to some some hours to cook in the oven, and hence there's kind of a long build up, a long sensory build up of um, of these uh, of these sort of delicious, homely uh, uh, smells that I think are a part of the dining experience really that we've kind of lost in a lot of our contemporary food practice. So our first thing to, to say would be to, to make the most of those smells. They are part of the meal. They do build our appetite. Uh, they may even get us to salivate. Then think about that sort of sharing element uh, of the dish. Is it better you know, to, to actually uh, slice and serve the roast at the table? Is that kind of more of a communal activity than doing all the, uh, all the slicing and portioning in the kitchen? Somehow you're eating the same food, but it's not quite shared in the same way. What sort of added value do we do we add for the diner if we tap into the the senses that, that you talk about in, in a lot of your work when it comes to food? Our experience of flavour of the foods that we eat kind of occurs first in our mind, in our brains, not in our mouths, um, because it's in our brains where for the first time the sight of the roast, the smell of the roast that you've been anticipating, the textures, the sounds, the feel, all of these things come together and it's in our brain those sensory cues attached to the roast come together with 
all of those sort of emotional feelings uh, and nostalgic feelings uh, about uh, roasts that we've had before. And it's that real kind of, you know, coming together of all the sensory elements uh, together with the more emotional, nostalgic elements that makes it uh, uh, the best it can be. Uh, and hence, by, by playing two senses, by not think, by thinking of the Sunday, not just as a nutritious meal for one, but thinking of it more in its sort of more, the, the more emotional and social role it plays in bonding people, um, then that helps you, I think, to, to, to think outside just the food and sort of the total experience how it's served, how it's presented, how it's shared. And how important is it that we, that we tap into all of the senses, so not just smell and sight, but the other parts of the human brain that, that can elevate a dish? Maybe if you ask people, you know, what, which senses are involved in the Sunday roast, then they'd say, well, I sort of taste it. Um, but all you actually get on your tongue is going to be sort of sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Um, a lot of the, 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 the more pleasurable elements of our food experience is really coming from the nose, from this kind of retronasal smell whenever we swallow. That's the meaty, that's the roast, that's the burnt, that's the, uh, uh, the vegetal notes are all coming through the nose. And those senses are kind of combined with what we see. Um, how fresh do the vegetables look? How, how, how appealing is the, is the kind of colour palette on the plate? Is it all browns or is it browns and whites with some colourful vegetables? That can all add to the eye appeal sound, I think. Which you might not think in a Sunday roast, you know, sound, does that really play a role there? Uh, but I'd argue it does. And you think about the crispness of your, of your, of your roast potatoes is certainly part of the pleasure is there in the crunch or in the uh, kind of crackling uh, as well. These are primarily auditory pleasures. And I think uh, no one really likes a silent meal. So it's important somehow or other to kind of bring that sound element in. Uh, as well as, of course, the kind of the touch and the, and the mouth feel, and, and maybe the textural qualities of the of the sauces and the gravies uh, that coat your mouth as you eat it. Professor Charles Spence, thank you so much for spending time with us today to explain that. Now let's get ourselves back into the kitchen. We're going to hear from three chefs to learn how to plate up Sunday roasts in three ways, looking at basic, better, and best. Hi, I'm Head Chef Jordan Mill Thompson, and today we're gonna to be plating up a real simple, basic roast dinner. I'm gonna show you how to take raw ingredients and make it look a thousand bucks. Let's get to it. I've placed the chicken skin side facing the customer. So first thing the customer will see is the golden chicken skin, crisp. The roast potatoes, we have three on the plate, so it's not too overwhelming for the customer. Cooked off the carrots whole, sliced them, just so you can see all the veins inside running through. It looks a little bit more premium to the customer. The parsnip over the top just gives it a beautiful appearance. And for the big finale, of course, the Yorkshire pudding, always homemade. Thanks, Jordan. Um, I'm now gonna do a sirloin of beef, which I'm gonna do family style service, just so we can change the presentation and change the perception that we give to the guests. I've got some glazed carrots. I'm just gonna finish with some flat leaf parsley. They've got some fennel seeds on them as well. So they get that nice glossy glaze on them. I then finish it with the flat leaf parsley for a bit of extra color. So the next thing I'm gonna do is the roast uh, parsley root and I've treated it exactly the same way that you would do a parsnip. So I've roasted it in a little bit of butter, a little bit of honey, just finishing it with a few sprigs of thyme. As you can see, comes out in that beautiful glossy brown colour. Great flavour, great depth of caramel from the honey. Next part for me, that roast beef with some braised red cabbage. Fantastic autumnal flavours, winter flavours like cinnamon in there, the acid the smell of the vinegar. Collie and broccoli cheese. They can all help themselves to gravy. On the table. Of course, some English mustard with your beef. Has to be Coleman's. And then the easy part. Three nice slices of beef. Some beautiful roast potatoes. Tiny bit of watercress. And of course, the crowning glory of a Yorkie pudding. So for you in the kitchen, you've got all the components of a roast, but you're taking away a little of what goes on the plate so that you can get yourself set for service. Lots of prep here, but can all be managed super quick and super fast in a service situation. So that's my family style service. We're gonna go over to Steve now, who's gonna do his dish, which is a roast pork. Thanks, Alex. I'm now gonna cook my roast pork and try and present it in a nice high-end way. 
the pork has been cooked nice and slowly. This skin has dried out really nicely. I'm just going to puff it in some really hot oil. And that hot oil is just going to help crisp that crackling up. It's important to keep it moving because it will can burn the skin otherwise. Okay, so now we've got that nice crispy skin on the pork. I'm gonna take a cutlet off of there. And the pork's still lovely and juicy inside. Season have a little bit of salt, pepper, pop that on a plate. And with this, we want refinement, but I think it's also important not to lose the essence of a roast, which for me is all about generosity. So here I'm just putting on some of our baby beetroots. And I think it's important to use all the parts of the baby beetroot as if we were using meat. It's important to use all parts of the animal. It's important to use all parts of the vegetable. So the baby beetroots themselves I've cooked in a little bit of red wine vinegar with some sugar, salt and thyme. Just boiled those until they're tender. And then I've just warmed them through in some butter with the, with the tops of the stems so we've wilted those down and also the stems themselves so you've got three different textures on there you've got the nice soft leaves the the soft um kind of yielding beetroots themselves and then also the crunchier stalks which i think is great and you've also got these lovely deep colors as well i'm going to add to that some sprouting broccoli the sprouting broccoli has just been blanched and then warmed through with some seasoning and and butter and the gravy here i've finished with some diced granny smith's apple so it gives it a nice sweet and sour flavor in there and also some whole grain mustard so you've got a little bit of heat which all works really nicely with the fatty flavor of the pork no roast is complete without crispy fluffy on the inside roast potatoes on the side so we don't pile everything up on top of each other on the plate too much so there's my roast rack of pork with beetroot and broccoli now we're going to go to clean bean from siam to talk about some vegan roasts. If meat isn't involved in a roast, the dish can sometimes unfortunately be neglected in terms of its appearance. But one place where this certainly isn't the case is Clean Bean in Seaham, Northeast England, where owner Linda Barron won the Great British Roast Competition for Vegan and Vegetarian in 2019. Linda is going to help us understand how we can give love to the meat-free alternatives so those of us who don't eat meat don't feel left out. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us first of all a little bit about Clean Bean. What sort of things do you do there? Hi, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, we at Clean Bean, we are a clean eating and um, healthy eating restaurant. Um, our entire menu is fully gluten free. And um, yeah, we have a little bit a different take on, on food, um, on, on Sunday lunch in general. And yeah, we've won the um, vegan and vegetarian um, roast dinner competition. Tell us about your meat-free roast. What makes it really popular? It is a mushroom nut roast. It's made in-house and it contains lots of beautiful flavors. Our principles is all around clean, healthy, nutritious food. We don't use any preservatives. We make everything from scratch. And that makes it very special because we don't buy in a ready meal or anything like that. So we literally use um, mushrooms, we use um, we use cashew nuts, um, onions, um, fresh herbs and spices. And this, yeah, this certainly makes a difference. It's um, full of flavor. Now, sometimes, um, as I mentioned in the intro, vegetarians and, and vegans um, get the, the raw end of the stick, really, when it comes to their meat-free alternative on a Sunday roast. What, what sort of things do people get wrong when it comes to that? For us, it doesn't mean having a meat-free dish, it's going to be lacking in flavor or anything. If anything, it'd be the opposite. It's all about flavors. If we go, for instance, um, forage like fresh um, garlic in the forest and things like that, according to the season. So if you use, you know, all natural flavors and herbs and spices, um, there is no need to compromise. And there is, you know, this is like real good plant based food at the end of the day. And that's whole food and nutritious. Now, when it comes to the, the look of, of the meat alternative on the 
play it, how do you make sure that it really sings to the customer in it and it looks just as good as a bit of roast beef or roast lamb would? It's all about obviously the presentation, you've got different colours, it's all very colourful. Our mushroom nut roast comes all with all the trimmings, so we have like um, fresh carrots, um, broccoli, cabbage. Like for, for somebody who values good quality food, I think um, it doesn't really make a difference if you eat meat or vegetarian. It comes all down to the flavor. And a vegetarian or vegan meal should never be bland, especially when it's made with fresh ingredients. Linda, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it today. Now it's time to speak to a food stylist who's going to show us exactly what we need to do to make our dishes look great on the plate. We eat with our eyes first is a well-known phrase many in the sector use. But how can time-strapped chefs in busy kitchens make their dishes look that little bit extra? Sue Todd is a food stylist and photographer and is going to help us understand how to make a plate of food sing. Sue, thanks for joining us. First of all, what makes an attractive plate of food? I think it's something that makes you feel hungry. Um, when somebody looks at it, they want to eat it. Even if that's not necessarily something that they'll normally have. I had someone who doesn't eat meat a little while ago say to me, gosh, Sue, that looks so attractive. I almost feel I could eat it. And that's what you want. Why should we make a plate of food look attractive? Being able to be seen more readily on social media at the minute is really important. It's so noisy out there. And if your images stand out, really stand out, they're going to catch attention and you might just get the edge on everybody else around you. If you're showcasing your food to the best of your ability and it looks great, then your reputation is going to rest on it. But if you haven't bothered and they're lit by yellow light and slightly out of focus or there's lots of mess in the background, it doesn't look as good and it doesn't probably tell the right story about your brand. Now you do this for a living, so you're, you've always got a keen eye for what looks good on a plate, but a lot of us don't necessarily understand the tricks of it. What are your top tips for chefs who are often time strapped to make a dish look that little bit more before it goes out to the customer? First of all, I'd probably say hire a pro. After that, I'd, pr I'd probably say learn to use the camera that you've got, even if it's just your phone, because if you know how to use it, you're going to get much better results than if you're just picking it up using the natural camera app and taking a quick picture. After that, I'd probably spend a little bit of time learning how to edit it better and not use the built-in filters for Instagram or whatever, because then you're like everybody else. For me, photography is all about telling a story and the story might be sort of, oh look, come and have a romantic meal for two, or it may be we do a lovely family lunch, but you need to get that whole story across. So it's how you put the composition together and whether it matches what the message is that you want to put out there. So quite often, sometimes you just want a picture of the actual plated meal, but other times you want it set up so that you've got an idea of the atmosphere that goes with it. And that can take a little bit longer. And if you're wanting to do that, then ideally you'll set up the scene first. So, and it sounds sort of cumbersome and boring, but it's well worth doing because the food doesn't stay alive for the camera very long. It looks great when it leaves the kitchen. It looks great when it's put down in front of the customer. But if you're putting it in front of a camera and you then need to start moving things around because you haven't got it quite right, the food, as far as the camera is concerned, will die so fast, it's not true. Meat will dry out, vegetables will go limp, salads will just disintegrate. So you have to be fast once you get there. So I will literally set up the scene um, with glasses, flowers, whatever is needed to set the right scene. And then I'll probably use something that's the same colour as the food to act as a sort of hero. Put that in, in view and just take a couple of shots and make sure the shot is what I think it's going to be because quite often you'll get it all plated up, then you'll say, I can't use that cloth on the background, or I need to put it on a different surface, or actually the plate's wrong. And at that point, it's too late. The food will have died, you'd have to recook. Definitely, I mean, that, that's some great advice, especially for social media, which is obviously more important now, like you said, to bring people into the business. So when you are plating up a dish ready to shoot it, what are you thinking of when, when you're looking at placement of the different items? on the plate? How do you approach a plate of food in that sense? 
you're going to be looking at what sort of picture is needed and what it's needed for. Unless you know what you're shooting for, you could get into a situation where you've shot a whole load of beautiful landscape pictures, but they're actually needed as part of an Instagram campaign. And because of the, the wide view that you've taken, they won't crop to the right size and look right. So that's really key. So knowing what you, you're shooting for and what the message is. Sometimes you might need some white space because you're going to have the, you know, the client needs or, your, or you might need some wording over the top. So think about that first. And then it's a case of making sure your plate's right and also making sure that it's not lost. Sometimes it's nice to go with a slightly smaller plate and arrange the food so that it looks bigger and you get a better view with the camera. Then it's making sure that you haven't got any splodges around the outside, that's nice and tidy, um, that you haven't got bits and pieces, crumbs all over the rest of the, the, view, the, the area in view, um, if you have to get rid of them. And it may be that you've got some bits of kitchen or whatever in the background. Look at it and see whether that's right or whether you need to move things around and get rid of that because it's detracting. You don't want anything that will compete with the food. And you want to make sure that your hero is the hero of the shot and get grabs the attention with the eyes and you haven't got something else that's in front of it or to the side of it that pulls the eyes a little bit more. So it's thinking about colours as well and getting the balance right. Perhaps you've got some um, slices of roast chicken and you've got some mashed potato and then perhaps for some, whatever reason you've got some white asparagus. That's all really white. You're putting it onto a white plate and it begins to just be lost. So you need to find some colour to add back into that. Now it could be um, some herbs, it could be some salad that's carefully arranged. Um, or some beautiful carrots and peas, whatever, but just something to lift the colour and make it sing again, but without taking the attention from whatever it is that needs to be the hero in the shot, which um, since we're talking about um, roasts in particular, it will be the meat. You need to make that the, the thing that sings. Sue, that's some really great advice. Thank you so much. Sue Todd from Sue Tog Photography. Now let's head back to the kitchen to see how one of our chefs plates up a uh, roast to take out. The last piece is about takeaways and uh, what businesses have done during this period to, to help grow their business and some people are keeping on going with it. So we're just going to give a quick uh, example of a takeaway roast. We've gone for a roast pork belly, we put it in the oven, nice high temperature, added in some cider just as it was cooking and used that for the base of the sauce. I've used the uh, gnaw uh, gravy granules for poultry, again, allergen free, suitable for vegans and vegetarians. And one of the most important parts of this product is it's got this sage flavor to it, sage and thyme, which I think works really well with the pork belly. So it goes into a takeaway container using the, the base, as I said, that uh, cider. Seal that up. Again, I've got some nice sides to go with it. So cream savoy cabbage with some carrots, Again, check with your customers about allergens because I've put dairy in all of these. And then just some nice green beans and tender stem broccoli with a little bock of butter. Roast potatoes with the sage in there. Okay, I've used foil containers again so that these can be reheated at home. Less washing up for the family, less arguments to be had afterwards. Pork, again, just cook it skin side down for a few minutes and then put it back in the tray and heat it up in your oven until it's thoroughly hot. Gravy, and of course, a little bit of apple sauce to go on the side. And that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope it filled you with all kinds of ideas about how to make your roast shine on the plate. In the next and final installment of the Great Roast Revival, we'll be focusing on future trends and speaking to all kinds of operators to find out what they think the future of the Great British Roast looks like. Thanks a lot and I'll see you next time.